Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so welcome to the first out of two invited talks. So the first invited talk will be given by Antoine Jou, and I will just give a few words on Antoine and, and his work. So Antoine uh, got his education uh, in Ecole Polytechnique in class of 86, and then he has been a member of the crypto team by Jacques Stern at ENS in Paris. And now he's a, a chief engineer at the DGA and also a professor at uh, the University of Versailles, Saint Quentin. And uh, <coughs> Antoine has been really broad in his research, working both on asymmetric and symmetric cryptography. So, and when I asked, asked around a little bit oh, to get his main contribution, I got a whole list of different things. So, uh, I can just mention a few of them. So, on uh, symmetric cryptography, uh, Antoine's work on hash functions is, is very well known, and uh, uh, the collision on SHA-0 and uh, introduction of uh, multi-collisions, and he has also uh, uh, been uh, a contributor in uh, correlation attacks on stream ciphers and also inventor of RMAC. And in asymmetric cryptography, uh, <coughs> he has the uh, tripartite Diffie-Hellman protocol, he has a work on cryptanalysis of HFE uh, and uh, use of pairings in cryptography, uh, major contributions. And of course, then uh, a lot of work on uh, discrete log and factoring. Uh, and we saw, for example, this morning, uh, Antoine was a co-author of, of the paper receiving the best paper award. So. Uh, at last, he has also service to the community, and he has been uh, director uh, at the uh, ISAR di director. So, uh, let me uh, welcome him here by giving him a, a big applause. So Thomas, thank you very much for the introduction. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, all the organizers for kindly inviting me to give this talk here. So, so as you know, when you receive an invitation to give an invited talk, the first thing is, oh wait, am I th this old now? <laughs> but uh, okay, after some time you, you just think about it and say, okay, of course, I'm going to accept it. It's a great honor. So what can I speak about? Uh, I'm not going to give the usual talk that I give uh, when I have a new algorithmic idea or whatever. I need to speak about something else. So the idea was I'm going to, to speak about high performance computing in cryptanalysis and try to give something, well, a tutorial is really too much. Just give my view on what is happening when you want to do big computation in cryptanalysis. And so this is what it is going to be about. So, but you're probably going to ask me, why do you want to speak about this? What is the point? Well, there is one very easy to explain motivation. It's the historical link. Uh, you all know that there has been a long standing relationship between computation and crypto, and the place where we are and the proximity of Bletchley Park is clearly there to emphasize this link. So all of you, you will be going to the Bletchley Park and visit either, the, well, or probably both, the Museum of Computing and the, the Museum uh, of, crypto, of Crypto and Crypto Analysis. So y you have all the link you want from an historical point of view. But of course, I am not an historian, so I don't know anything about this. So this cannot be the reason I am going to give this talk. So the other reason is 
uh, doing big computation in cryptanalysis is really kind of a background activity uh, that you do in support of research. And, well, at least that I do in support of research, and which is very important uh, to give new idea, to put a uh, new idea in a concrete form, and, uh, and moreover, it's something we never speak about. You know, it's as in the fairy tales. You never know what happens after the happy ending. Everything is fine, the algorithm is magic and is going to do everything. Okay, you may get a glimpse of the prince at the end of his life, and you, I am going to tell you we have done such a big computation, just as Vanessa did during the first talk. We have done a big computation. You give, uh, we give you a, a little details, but that's it. But what happened while doing the computation? So, well, it's mundane, it's boring, it's whatever, so nobody wants to hear about this. But in fact, it's not that boring. It's, it's even fun. Well, sometimes frustrating because it often doesn't work, but still, it can be really fun. So that's my motivation for speaking about this. So next you can tell me, okay, but large computation are not done only in cryptanalysis, so why speak about this very specific kind of computation? Well, obviously it's because of the kind I do, but there are some really specific things that are quite important when you do computation in cryptanalysis and differs from other computation. The first thing is we are really simple-minded and we want to do either a demonstration that some algorithm is working, or we just want to break a record. So we don't want computations that you can run every day to do, uh, to do basic things. We just want to do it once and be done with it. So this has a nice consequence. We don't need to reuse our code. So we can program in whatever way we want. So by the way, if someone here wants to do nice programming in a company, just close your ears and don't listen to me because I will give bad ideas. <coughs> and uh, another thing is, since we are doing record breaking, we need to find computing power. And you all know the sayings about given horses. So you just use whatever is available. So sometimes you can run computation on strange things, which makes things even funnier. And a final point, which is really a crucial thing, uh, is that when you do computation in crypto, Usually, the end result is really easy to check. If I have computed large discrete logs, I can just give you the discrete logs, and you are going to check them very easily. And this is not the case for many other kinds of, of, of computation. For example, in physics, if I, have doing, if I am doing weird stuff to compute the behavior of planets or whatever, the only way you can check uh, if what I am doing is correct is by redoing the computation or by having a real-world model. But but you can't just look at the end data and say it's OK. In our case, this is a very important thing. So one of the consequences is that we can do whatever we want. As long as the end result is correct, everything is fine. That's the positive way of seeing it. The negative way of seeing it, if, if something fails, then at the end, well, you have nothing to show. <coughs> OK. So when you are doing this kind of big computation, there are a few main steps. So the, main, the first main step is to have some algorithmic starting point. So you need to have something you want to do a computation on. Uh, and usually, you just validate this by some kind of toy implementation in, in a high-level language, in magma, if you are doing number theory, or well, whatever. OK. The second point, uh, this is rather political stuff, you need to go away and beg for computing power and whatever. Just find computing power. And once you have it, you need to choose a target computation which is compatible with it. Uh, well, then, the easy thing, you just need to program the stuff. And, and after that, you need to run the computation. And this is, you know, just the boring thing nobody cares about. But in fact, uh, well, it's not that easy. And it's really something you need to, we, we need to work in. And one of the points of uh, high performance computing is enabling people to be able to manage large computation without too much hassle. OK. So what kind of starting point can you start from? 
well, basically anything uh, in crypto. So I have written a personal sample of the kind of thing you can use, but you just can add your favorites to it. So you can, of course, do things with lattice reduction. I did this kind of thing a long time ago during my PhD. You can uh, have fun with collisions and multi-collision. Uh, you can use elliptic curves, pairings, and even more complicated stuff. Uh, you can do index calculus, of course. Uh, you can have fun by, with new kind of decomposition algorithm uh, that you can use for knapsacks, codes, or whatever. And, uh, and you can do some Grobner basis. Or, well, there are hundreds of, stuff, of things you can do. This is just a short sample uh, of, of things which are not trivially easy to compute and which can make uh, big fun when doing large computations. OK. But even if you have a nice starting point, Sometimes uh, they are not treated to make big computation. Why? Because sometimes just by having a toy implementation, you already get something which is very nice and doesn't need much more to, to, become, uh, to become something interesting. So one example is, uh, you know, pairings. Uh, as Thomas said, uh, one of the things I have been doing in the past was proposing this tripartite Diffie-Hellman stuff. Uh, how did, it, did, did this come around? Well, at that time, uh, it was back in, two, uh, in 1990, uh, well, 99, sorry. Uh, and in 99 at uh, Eurocrypt, there was a paper uh, comparing the reduction of uh, Menezes Okamoto von Stone on Fryrock. Uh, so, comparing two kinds of pairings uh, for crypt analysis of discrete log and elliptic curve. And, well, what happened in, when I read this paper, I said, OK, wait a minute. Uh, I have a toy implementation on my computer, and it's faster, much faster than what the authors are reporting. So what, what's the thing? Uh, what should I do with this? And it was at that point that I realized if it's that much faster, it was, you know, a toy implementation in Paris GP, which is some program you probably used, and it took a few a few seconds to compute a pairing. So, well, if it's that much faster, then probably we can use it constructively. And, well, you all know the story. Uh, so you just have no big computation to do. Another thing is a recent paper with Sorina Ionica, we, which is called Pairing the Volcano. We are doing some crazy computation with uh, isogeny volcanoes. And, OK, there are some very nice, interesting algorithmic techniques proposed by, uh, by Sorina. And the implementation are just ma basic magma code. And they are way enough to do, uh, to do kind of records on, on better things than what we could do previously. So there is no need for, uh, for more than a toy implementation. So OK, we fail. We have nothing to do. Uh, <coughs> so. If we don't fail at this early step, then we need to find computing powers. Uh, there are many ways to do this. The first thing is, you know, the old-fashioned technique. Uh, we all use this in the past. Well, I did in it. It's just, uh, well, look around, find machines that you have access to, and just use them. So the nice thing is that this is easy to arrange, especially if you can buy a few extra machines. Uh, usually, you can control the kind of machine you buy. And you know that the resources are here, and you can use them. The problem is, well, it's not easy to squirrel. Because if, even if you have money to buy 10 computers, you can buy 100. If you have money to buy 100, you don't have money to buy 1,000. So it stopped quite soon. Uh, the next thing which has been proposed uh, for factoring is you just use all these idle cycles on the machine around on the internet. Uh, you know, all of you have computers which are doing nothing, so I just beg compu computing power from you and try to use it. Well, I must admit that I have never done this because uh, one, there are really huge requirements which make the thing too much of an hassle. One of the requirements is that you must be very user-friendly, which is not not easy. You really need to program nice stuff and have nice screensaver or whatever. OK, I have no time to do this. And 
Some people can do it, but I can't. Uh, the next thing is, if you go for this, then you are doing your computation in an adversary model. You never know. Some of the computer might send you just crap data to corrupt your, your computation. And this is not easy to deal with either. And finally, one of the very important problem is the limited communication bandwidth, uh, which is a real problem when you want to do huge computation, especially for linear algebra things. Or, so I have never done this. Another thing which is very nice, which is occurring these days, is you just go to one of the large computing centers, there are several around Europe, and you, you say, I would like power. And if you are lucky enough, they give you some power. And this is very nice, uh, because you have a very high and dedicated computer. Uh, OK, you don't control the architecture. You have to fit uh, within it, but it's still OK. Uh, the problem is uh, the job management is not always easy. So running your computation in this machine is not necessarily easy. And if you don't have the luck to be able to apply and get things from here, you can also go uh, for high performance computing in the cloud and just buy your computing power from whichever provider you want. OK? Uh, well, personally, I prefer to try the free option, but uh, because in France, trying to use the money to buy this kind of computing power is an administrative nightmare. So don't want to do this. <coughs> OK. So now, assuming you, uh, you have your computing power, uh, what you want to do is you choose a target. So this is easy. Your target must be f corresponding to the, co to the computing power you have. It can be either a proof of concept. Sometimes it's enough. It can be a real size demonstration. And the best case is you can attack cryptographic size parameter or make a new record. You can't always do that. And when you choose your target, you should be reasonably sure that you are not going to work for four, six months and get nothing at the end. So be reasonable. OK. So when is it enough to do a proof of concept? Well, I have a few examples. Uh, one of my old things about uh, SHA-0 computation, we just did a, 35 round, uh, a collision on 35 rounds of SHA-0. It was a few minutes of computation, so it was just a demo. But, well, it was the only point in the attack where we could have a full collision. And at that time, stupidly, we had no clue that near collision could be interesting. Sorry. The uh, next thing we can do for proof of concept is what we have been doing for all the new, the new algorithm for, nap, for hard knapsacks. While, why we only, we only need a proof of concept here is because all these new algorithms are trivially parallelizable. There is some value somewhere that you just need to loop on. So you can really benchmark the thing by just choosing the correct value. If you know the solution, you know the correct value. And you benchmark the algorithm very easily without, without having to run for a very long time. So proof of concept is enough. And it's the same thing for linear decoding that you will see in a few days. OK. A uh, more interesting case is when you do something which was not previously possible, but we using a very moderate amount of computing power. So for example, we did a, something like this with Louis Grand Boulin a long time ago. And we broke some knapsack-based uh, hash function proposed by Damgard, which was very interesting, but which happened to be very easy to break by lattice reduction using only uh, short computation. Uh, similarly, uh, with Elian Jolm, we, did, uh, we proposed a new, a new cryptanalysis of an old uh, system called PKP, uh, PKP, sorry. And uh, OK, it was a the full run would have been very long. But once again, knowing the correct value, you could demonstrate the thing by a reasonable computation. And the main thing here that we, was that we were able to reduce the memory. OK. Another thing is what uh, Thomas speak about uh, uh, is uh, um, correlation attack on LFSRs, uh, where, well, we could do uh, real life, well, 
a 40 bit LFSR example, a fast correlation attack on 40 bit LFSR, uh, which is something which is not that uninteresting because some crypto system around use several of those and combine them together. And in this case, if you have some correlation and you can improve the correlation attack, you attack the LFSRs, the individual LFSRs one by one. But it was only a few CPU days computation. So, it, okay, it's just a medium easy case. A similar thing is uh, what we did with Vanessa uh, much more recently uh, when we considered uh, the discrete logarithm problem of an uh, extension field of degree 5, not 6. And at that time, uh, the, the full computation was totally out of range. But what we could do was demonstrate uh, how partial sieving uh, was going, uh, well, partial relation construction was going, and uh, by using an adapted version of Robner basis computation, we were able to do the thing using a small amount of computing power, but just a demo case only. Okay. So once you have eliminated all these options, you know now that you are going to aim at some record or some very large computation. So you know the computing power, you know your target, you know what you are doing. So what you need to know to do now is code the stuff. Okay, I will just skip this because it's really easy. Uh, it's really the easy part. You spend a few weeks coding. And the thing is, keep it very simple and stupid. Avoid all the fancy stuff. You know, object-oriented programming. What is that? You don't need it. Uh, just remain at low level. Okay, C and assembly is very nice. All the rest is just fancy stuff that is going to get in your way later on. Uh, for the same reason, avoid library everywhere, unless you really, if it's some very minor task you need to do once and don't want to rewrite, it's OK. But that's the only exception. Uh, avoid adding new and new and new stuff. It's going to make the computation, computation impossible to manage. Uh, don't care about reusability or portability of your code. Anyway, you will throw it away because it's the best thing to do to improve it. And uh, just make sure that your, your code will be easy to change because you will need it. And optimize, but not too much. And um, the main rule is to avoid nasty surprises because lots of nasty surprises are creeping around. So that's why avoid library and program from scratch and use kind of very conservative and defensive programming. I will explain later what I mean by defensive, but it's very important. Okay. And then you go to, you know, the mundane, tedious, boring step of running the computation. Uh, OK. But you will see that surprise are, are there. The first, thing, the first thing is you have your target in mind, but just don't jump to your target because uh, the landing will be hard. So <laughs> what you need to do is scale up slowly to the intended size. So you start by some examples that should be easy, and then goes up from this. And expect problems. The first problem is that software, software can easily fail. Well, you know all the easy stuff you have not looked at while preparing the computation, all the easy phases, well, they don't scale at all. So you expect to have to reprogram them on the fly as the computation size grows because they are not working anymore. Um, OK, of course, since you have programmed everything in a rush, there are hundreds of bugs around just waiting for you. But there are rare bugs that only come on you at the worst moment. So what you need to do is to make sure that they are not going to make you spend four months doing a computation just to fail at the end, because this is ridiculous. So as far as you can, you try to stop somewhere at several positions in your computation and try to check the data by using just independent, easy to write code that looks at the thing and say, okay, is this reasonable or complete crap? 
if it's reasonable, or, or if even better, if it's, this is guaranteed, then you are fine. If it's crap, it's time to go back and do something else. OK. Well, then after expecting software problem, expect hardware problem. The first hardware problem risk is, you know, electricity is very nice, magic, but very often it fails. Well, you might say in real life it doesn't fail that often, but when doing large computation, well, it's a real thing. Uh, if you are doing computing power on shared computers, availability of the computing power is a real problem. So avoid having too tight a schedule, because usually you will not meet it. And the worst thing is, I don't know why, but whenever I try to do some very big computation, I have nasty surprises, you know? Everything seems fine, but when you reread the data at some point, there is something wrong. All the numbers are correct, but one of the numbers is wrong. This this cannot be a bug, well, unless you are extremely unlucky. There is no way this could be a bug, because usually when a single bit goes wrong somewhere, it's going to amplify. So the most probable thing is it's probably an hardware fault. And depending on the machine, you can get some bit corrupted in memory at some point, or something which, which is probably more probable is when you write down your result to disk, you know you are using complicated protocols to share the disk between machines. Who knows what happens? Not me. <laughs> but usually, <laughs> you may have problems. So once again, check your data, because uh, if they are wrong, the SQL is not going to be fun. OK. So just to let you have in mind, uh, a kind of scale of what big computation are, I have looked around and find a few reference points. So, you know, reference points from crypto mostly, but a few from other places. Uh, when you look at crypto examples, so the largest uh, computation, discrete log computation in finite field I am aware of was done by Klein Young in 2007. And it was 160 digits. And the total uh, computing power was this. So it's about 17 uh, CPUs a year. So if, if you do this on a single uh, core, when I write CPU throughout the talk, I mean core. Because now you have this, this processor with four cores or eight cores or whatever, and you don't, never know how to count them. So I'm, I mean one core. So if you just use a single core, you are going to run for 17 years. So this, this is not a small computation, but they are larger. The largest computation uh, which, which is finished, I am aware of, is this RSA 7768, uh, which took, you see, 1,500 years for the saving and uh, 150 more for the linear algebra which really is big, OK? And it's so big that I have not written the full list of authors. They are, it's a really long list, because managing this stuff really need the human people to be there and try to, to run the thing and correct the computer and do everything. So it's really a ma major project just to run this kind of thing. The one before, the RSA 200 digit, was much smaller. Okay? And if you really want to have a huge computation, then ask Dan. They are still running this uh, EC, uh, elliptic curve uh, 130 bits on a binary field by using a generic algorithm. So this is something which, which is feasible, but at the real range, uh, li real limit of feasibility. And the estimated, uh, the estimated power is around uh, 16,000 years on a single core which is really a huge computation. OK, so some computation from other field. Uh, some people, you know, in number theory, like computing digits of pi. Uh, the last record is 10 trillion digits. Uh, OK, it took three CPU years. 
Well, it's rather a small computation compared to some of the, of the one above in crypto. And just to have, uh, to have some more things, I looked at the, uh, at the press. So press is a European thing to where you can apply for computing power. So I looked at, the, at their site and looked at the latest project and the time allotments that were given during the last call for project. And the, the biggest thing they gave was for climate simulation and the total number of, uh, of the total computing power that has been all allocated to this project is uh, 16,000 uh, 16, years. So exactly what would be needed uh, to do the, big, uh, the biggest computation in, in crypto above. So you see, big computation in crypto are not this ridiculous compared to big computation at large. OK. <coughs> so. Now let's go for a few examples of computation I have done in the old or recent past, just to see uh, kind of things that may happen when you do this. So one of the oldest examples I want to speak about is a point counting on elliptic curve, which we did back in 98 with uh, Reynald Lercier. And the starting point was uh, Reynald PhD thesis from 97. And you probably know that when you want to count uh, points on elliptic, uh, on elliptic curve uh, using the scoff uh, elki sadkin algorithm, what you do is you have two main phases. The first phase is you just compute partial information about the number of points modulo small numbers. And once you get this, you need to pass everything together. And the classical technique at that time was called the match and sort algorithm. And the idea was just do a collision search on the elliptic curve. OK. And this cost a lot in memory. You know, the time and memory of this kind of algorithm are the same. You need to have big lists in memory, sort them, and lo then look for a collision. OK. Uh, at that point, we had some modular data available for, for large computation. And it w as it was natural, Reynald had started the match and sort thing, and it re required one month. OK, easy, just wait. The problem is that we had a power shutdown after three weeks. Well, the real story is even worse than that. You know, two weeks after the computation had started, we had a call from the people uh, uh, doing the maintenance of the, of the place. And they tell, told us, OK, in one week, we are going to shut the power to do some maintenance, electrical maintenance. OK, nice. It, will, it will, is going to be on, on, uh, on Wednesday morning. Oh, problem. Because the, the program was not doing any saving of the data to this, so we couldn't restart it. OK. So during this week, we, we worked hard to find a way to core dump the program in a way that would allow us to restart the computation. Good. On Thursday uh, noon, we were ready. We knew exactly how we were going to dump the data to restart after the power failure. So we went for lunch. And when we came back from lunch, uh, the electrician told us, oh, we were preparing for tomorrow, but somehow the power went out. <laughs> OK. So in this case, what you do is, oh, do I restart the computation or no? We went back to the drawing board. Can we solve the problem in a different way? And we could. And we, find, we found a new algorithm with the same asymptotic complexity where time is concerned, but that used m a much smaller amount of memory. And we could do the computation using four CPUs during a single night. And during a single night, usually you don't have any power failures. So it was fine. And well, and the description of the algorithm went in this paper one year later. OK, and as I said, we reduce the memory cost. So I told you before that the first SHA-0 stuff I did was 
just a toy example that we had nothing to do with it. But a few years later, things had progressed, and it became possible to try to attack SHA-0, really. And so it was based on an improved version of the analysis. And essentially, uh, what you had to do was find a differential path and try to follow it uh, long enough. So this really looks like a brute force algorithm. So it's uh, what people in high performance computing call embarrassingly parallel. It means you just have nothing to do. You put all the machine you have, you start them at different points, and tell them, OK, just go on. And so this is quite easy. And it was the first time I did some big computation on, on borrowed power. You know, I, some people had some big machines. They wanted to give power to people to try them. So OK, that's a good idea. We can try it. And after uh, 8,000 CPU hours, which is roughly nine CPU years, not that big, three weeks real time on 160 CPUs, we got a collision. We, which was published one year later in, in this paper. OK. So this was really easy. No bad news, no power failure. The only fun thing is, at that point, I went to see the, the machine. And the guy who was uh, managing the machine told me, OK, you know, these are cold and these are hot. These ones are running your computation. <laughs> so it's fun. OK. So the next more recent example is uh, a triple collision algorithm uh, from 2009 with uh, Stefan Lux. So we, have, uh, a we had a paper about this in Azure Crypt 2009. And we wanted really to illustrate that this algorithm was, was interesting in practice. So the idea is, if you look at the early literature to find a triple collision in a random function, you need a lot of memory. And when you need a lot of memory, it's not possible to do the things. So what we found was a simple way to reduce the, the, the amount of memory. And with this reduced amount, you get a, a computation with three phases. Phase one is you just compute many iterations of the function for which you want to find collision. You start from random value, you add iterate, until you get some distinguished point, and then you stop. OK, and you do this many times in parallel using many machines. So this is easy. Then you get everything centralized, and you sort the value and find triples with the same endpoint. And you rerun roughly phase one on these triples to make the sequence converge. And if you are lucky enough, you, you get the triple collision. OK. The problem is we, we are looking for power. And at that time, uh, well, we only found some very strange machines where most of the computing power was on graphic cards. You know, it was a recent period when people said, oh, graphic cards are very, uh, are very efficient when you compare their cost to their computing power. So let's use them to do computation. And we had this. OK, so it was... Uh, a strange experience to program on these things. Uh, thankfully, the algorithm was easy enough to make this reasonably simple, to keep the program short and easy and whatever. And it was, well, it was really eight times faster than doing, uh, than doing the same thing on the CPUs of the machine. And knowing that the CPUs costed about the same thing as a graphic card, it really means that in terms of raw computing power, it was really true, the, the graphic cards were much more efficient. OK, the so phase two, this was easily done on a single CPU. The so phase three, well, you need to synchronize three things. And it's really more complicated than just doing this stupid phase one. So for this reason, since, since it's also less costly, it was easier to code it and do it on the CPUs of the machine. And uh, after all, we had the triple collision on a 64 uh, cryptographic, 64-bit cryptographic function, you know, the XOR of two deaths. And uh, it was only a 100 CPU days computation. So it's only four months, something, well, three months, something small. OK. 
So now my last example, which is probably the most interesting one, is a kind of a sequel of, uh, of Vanessa's talk. I'm going to give you a bit more details about what's happening when we do this kind of, of big computation. Okay. Well, index calculus is an old friend. Uh, I have been doing this kind of computation since, well, probably 98. So discrete logs in GFP, discrete log in GF of 2 to the n, uh, discrete logs in GF of p to the n for not so small uh, prime, uh, and other less classical stuff. So all this is index calculus. So it's really a known landscape. It should be very easy. Well, I can promise it's not a routine task, even if you have done it many times before. Yeah. Okay. And you are going to see why now. Okay. So just to know about the, the magnitude of the computation we had previously, uh, you are going to see that they are quite small. Everything is expressed in CPU days, not years. So it's, you see it's quite small. The biggest one we did was this uh, discrete log in GF of 2 to the 613, which was only three CPU, three CPU years. And, uh, and you also have the kind of architecture you, we have been using for this stuff. So in the early days, it was just single, uh, single core machines, which were very easy to use. And then we went to quadri-core machine, and then to machine with 16 processors. OK. And, and this one was four machines with 16 processors each. So it's OK, but it's still small. It's something that you can uh, use at home. Well, mostly. And uh, so all these records were done with very small computing power. OK. So now let's start from the initial view we had for GF of P to the 6. So the theoretical view uh, is very easy. Vanessa just gave it before. So what we want to do is first Sieve, then do linear algebra, and then find all the individual logar uh, logarithm for all the extra value you want to, to, to get. OK. This is the theory. Very easy, three line, nothing to explain. Well, the practice, uh, what happened? I don't know. Phase one, you need to sieve. Um, strangely enough, after saving, some of the relations on the disk are incorrect. Nobody knows why. So verify the relation by testing whether they really add to zero on the elliptic curve. It cannot hurt, and it's better than having something wrong. Uh, the linear algebra, well, this was the theory, but in practice, linear algebra is more complicated than that. We do Structure Gaussian elimination, then Longchamps algorithm. That's what we had in mind because uh, Longchamps algorithm is what we have been using previously with Reynolds for all the computation, and then complete the logarithm, uh, which is quite fast. It's kind of a backward Gaussian elimination to to get the extra uh, the extra logarithms. Okay. On this initial view, it's slightly co more complicated than the theoretical one. But it worked quite well. We had everything confirmed for, with a small computation on 130 bits. OK, so a, a bit more data. The saving was just one hour on 200 CPUs, so very easy. Uh, we got 50 million equations in 2 million variables. And after the structure Gaussian elimination, we are down to 600,000 uh, 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 equations on variables. Uh, the linear algebra, the long show step, was one full day on uh, 128 CPUs, but it's still OK. And all the rest was easy. So the total thing was half a year of computing power. OK. So very easy, simple computation, no problem. OK. So clearly, as I told you before, we try to scale up slowly. So don't go from 130 bit to 160, try to take steps. Because uh, 
it's, it can be useful. So we first, the first two steps, we are going to 6 times 23 and 6 times 24. Well, as I told you, the easy steps do not scale at all. When we try to do the structure Gaussian elimination, uh, for 6 times 23, it was roughly OK, but already at 6 times 24, we, are, we didn't add enough memory on the machine to do it. So we had to do the structure Gaussian elimination on disk, which makes things a bit harder. Uh, and then it became too slow, and we had to do it on, in a multi-threaded way. And even after doing this, the equation coming out of the structure Gaussian elimination, a few of them were wrong. So it might be a bug, it might be an hardware failure, you never know. So, so thankfully, in, the ca in this specific case, the equation coming out of the structure Gaussian elimination still makes sense on the elliptic curve. So just go back to the elliptic curve and check them. If they are correct, keep them. OK, the second problem we have is that long shots is getting slow. And the problem is ma made harder because on the machine, we have a time limit on jobs. You can't run for more than a day. Then your job is killed. OK, so you need to find an automated process to save and restart uh, without having too much trouble. OK, so for the 6 time, six time 23, well, saving was three hours on 1,000 CPUs. Something very easy to, you don't need to do anything. Uh, the structure Gaussian elimination, not enough memory. So rewrite to work on disk and then multi-thread and OK. And we started from almost 900 million equations in 4 million variables. And after the elimination, we were down to 1 million equations. So it was divided by four, the number of, uh, of variable, which is, which is quite good for Gaussian elimination. And finally, it was just a few hours on 32 CPUs. So it's OK. Corrupted equation, add a check. And Langshaw's was three days. Good. Uh, strangely enough, completing the data, you know, it was 10 minutes before. Well, now it's 17 hours. Well, it's somehow related to the structure Gaussian elimination. The fact that this one is becoming harder makes this one hard also. But still, the, the final phase, individual logarithm, was uh, a few minutes. At this time, we used the magma code. Now it would be 40 seconds. Oh, no, 14 seconds. So it's OK. The total thing was one year. So you see, half a year, one year. OK, scaling is finally not that bad. Uh, 6 times 24, OK? You see that the real problem is long shows, because saving is still very fast, less than a day. Long shows is getting slower. Well, the problem is that there is an unbalance. Here we are using 1,000 CPUs, and here only 64, so clearly something is wrong. And the total CPUs is almost four years. OK. So now the next step, which is logical, is the one Vanessa presented this morning. We go to 6 times 25. And as I said, Langshaw is going very slow. We need to, to split the job in a nice way. It's very, very complicated. Completing the, disc the logarithm is becoming harder. And it's even worse than before. The corruption on disk is back. So after completing the computation of discrete logarithm, something really strange occurred. Most of the logarithms were correct. Well, almost all, to say the truth. But a few here and there were incorrect. And trying to do backward Gaussian elimination with a few false value uh, doesn't l lead to any correct result. So we had, to add, uh, we, we, we had to add a correction step to remove the incorrect logs. 
which, which was obtained. OK. So as Vanessa said this morning, sieving was very easy. 62 hours, well, two days and a half on 1,000 CPUs. 14 gig, 14 uh, billion equations in 16 million variables. OK, we went down to 3 million, so five-fold improvement. And this took about a day. When we say about a day, it means that when we do the Gaussian elimination on disk, uh, it fi in fact, we need to run it several times to adjust some strange, crazy parameter until we find the right one. And once you have the right one, it's, it's just a few hours. But you need to find the right parameter by dichotomy search or whatever. But the long shows was a full month. And this is really a pain. OK. Uh, the total was 12 CPU year. So the next logical step, the so one you probably expected to see uh, here, was 6 times 26. OK. So the theory was there. The view confirmed by, by 6 times 25 is here. So everything is fine. We should be able to do it. And the long shows should take four months. It's long, but it should be achievable. So the sieving, OK, this time we were in a rush. So we sieved an 8,000 processor. So it was just a day. Oh, first problem. And for some reason, it w to do the full sieving on the parametrization we had, would have taken 27 hours. So the saving was cut in the middle. Well, not a problem. You are losing a few equations, except that it was also cut in the middle of an equation. So to reread the files, we had to patch the program again. OK, not a real problem, but in practice, it can be inconvenient. So now we have 40, million, 40 billion equations. And in 33 million variables, we can do the Gaussian elimination, go down to 6 million, which is large but feasible. And we expect the long shows to be done in four months. OK, just launch it. So we started on September the 22nd. So of course, it should be finished. Uh, well, it was slower than expected in real time, because the machine was very busy. Uh, and we had to wait between the runs. So the jobs were just there, waiting for computing power to become available again. This is a, this is a mess. So at the, the end, we expected the computation to end on the 4th of February. So we were there, waiting for the computation to end. So you know you have 1,000 round left of the long shots, and 100, then 10, then 5. And then, why didn't it stop? The orthogonalization process did not stop. So mathematically, this is impossible, OK? <laughs> because if, if you have a matrix of dimension 6 million, you can't expect to find more than 6 million orthogonal vector, or, well, mutually orthogonal vectors. This is not possible. But it still happened. So it might be a bug, it might be whatever. So OK, so it failed. So how can we process? The, the first option was, OK, add a sanity check. This can be done easily in long shows. Because when you, when you save your data to disk on long shows, one thing you could do is look at the vector you have currently and check whether they are still orthogonal to the very first vector of the computation. If they are, everything is probably fine. And if they are not, everything is probably wrong. So, OK. So this could be done. But running again for four months, <sighs> OK. Especially since we only have access to the machine till the end of May. OK. So the second option is try to improve long shows to get more CPUs. But due to the communication, even if we can do this, we are not going to gain enough in scale to make something reasonable. So option three, go back to the drawing board. OK, so go back to the drawing board. Oh, the solution is known. 
you know, you, we should use Brock Wiedemann by Copper Smith. And uh, it has already been used several times by Tome for this computation of discrete log and by Klein Jung for this one. So each time they had oh something which was about a one month computation. And the systems were smaller than ours. So it's not clear. It's not clear we can do it really. So okay. But still. There are three phases. The first phase is very nice because instead of having a single run of matrix vector multiplication, you do several runs in parallel independently from each other. So you can use computing power easily. Then you need to find a linear relation between all this stuff. And there is this paper by Tome which explains how to do it with uh, an efficient, uh, efficient algorithmics. And finally, you need to recompute part of what you did in the first uh, in the first phase and derive a solution from it by putting this data inside, uh, inside. Okay. But clearly, what we have here is not good enough for our purpose. So if we want this to work, we need to scale up the approach and get something, uh, something better. Okay. So we did develop this, uh, this program. And what is happening on the previous example? I told you, scale up slowly. So restart from this example and look at what is going to happen. So I recall the long shows uh, data. And OK, first phase, do s OK, we scaled up. So we decided to do 32 independent matrix vector multiplication. Oh, this can be done on 33 hours using 1,000 cores. So it, me it means that for each computer with 32 cores, we are doing a run of matrix vector multiplication, and it can be done very quickly. Uh, next, we use Tomei's algorithm. So this is done on a single computer with 32 cores, and it's quite fast. In nine hours, we are done. We get the, we get the relations uh, we need, the linear relation we need. And then we redo half of the matrix vector multiplication phase, and in 15 hours, we get the thing. So the total CPU time is a bit bigger than what we had before, but the real time went down to 28 days to two days and a an half. OK? So now the new thing to do the sieving, uh, to do the, the complete computation, including sieving, is five days real time. OK? And the magnitude of the computation is 14 CPU years. So the only thing we need to do uh, is scale up to the next one. OK. So I on first eye, that here the real time is without counting the weights between the one day runs. OK, because we are doing nothing, but we are still waiting. OK, so what is happening? Uh, one and the expected time is for the first phase is 125 hours, so five days. We started on March the 28th, so it should be finished. OK, so well, the power was back the day after, but the machine is very busy these days, and the first phase is still running. I just checked this morning before the talk, and out of the 32 threads, only 24 are finished. So I can't give any more results for today. And that's it. So we may have time for one or two questions. Do we have a mi microphone? Probably, yes. Oh, OK, so just to, OK, that's a very good question. When I give uh, my timing in CPU years, I give the timing in current CPUs at the time the computation was done. So it means that uh, Moore's is not taken into account, at least for the, for the time when the 
processor were go power were going up. And why did I make this choice? It's because uh, when you perform the computation, it's irrelevant. Managing a one processor computation is not harder if the, computer, the processor is going 10 times faster. OK? So what is happening is doing bigger computation with more cores is still harder. So with the new big machines, things are becoming slightly easier. You can scale up the computation a little. But still, if you want to do a 1,000-year computation as the RSA factoring, it's a major project. So this was, uh, this was the point of choosing this strange-looking unit. Further questions? OK, so then let's thank Antoine again. <laughs>